Usually in us versus them ads, it's like us versus the other guys. But like to just be like, we all know who we're talking about here. Anytime I see something like this, I'm like, well, well duh. Taco Bell's ahead of OpenAI on the most innovative companies list. Who wrote this? Welcome back to another episode of Whale Informed, the show where we don't give you business advice, but we do make our marketing director say the whaleys 500 times on camera. Ethan, what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about Mr. Beast dropping his show on Amazon Prime TV. After that, Ben and Jerry's. Then we're going to dive into the 50 most innovative tech companies according to Fast Company. And then finally, we're going to conclude with our favorite tweets of the week. We're going to check them out and uh, break them down. Let's kick it off. Senior Beast, Mr. Beast uh, announced, I think this week, early this week, that he is going to do a game show with Amazon Prime. Uh, here are the details that we know currently. It's the largest number of contestants ever. It's the biggest cash prize ever. It's the it's like just the biggest of everything. That's the main, but the biggest cash prize and largest number of the contestants. I don't think Mr. Beast would do it any other way. Uh, he's said things that you know, like that he's going to bring sort of a very YouTube, more fast paced type of vibe to it. Some of the episodes might cut off in the middle of the episode and then pick up. You know, like they might not wrap up a challenge or something like that. Uh, he's not hinting. He's trying not to hint and give away too much. He hasn't said where it's going to be filmed. It's not going to be filmed on his campus. Uh, because he doesn't want people camping out there. So uh, what do you make of this, Ethan? He's going all out. And I guess yeah. I wouldn't expect anything less. Like I did not realize he was going to send it as much as he is. And it sounds like this is, truly will be a unique game show that we haven't seen before. Yeah. So that is super interesting. And I like that he's going to bring the YouTube aspect into it and kind of break the mold of the traditional game show. The other thing that's interesting that I did read was that apparently – this was Netflix's deal with him to lose. And a lot of people are saying they fumbled the bag. Now Amazon stepped in and created the deal with him. So that was an interesting tidbit because I do think Amazon is going to crush this and there's a lot that they can gain from this partnership. I think that Feastables and Amazon being such a like big e-commerce and commerce company probably puts them in a better position to do this deal with him. Uh, and, and pay him and give him creative control. So here is what he said about like the deal is that the biggest, most important thing that was important to him was creative control. And he, without saying it, he kind of said that he may have given up some money, right? Like he might mm -hmm. have given up the amount of money and gotten paid less to have full creative control. And that's where he couldn't come to it with Netflix. He wouldn't say it was Netflix, but... Sounds like it was most likely Netflix. Um, is that they just still wanted some level of creative control? Uh, a big one that he said was Final Edit. So they wanted Final Edit, and he's like, Final Edit is every like you could make the right. whole show different in Final Edit, you know. And, and the most important thing for him is that he feels like he cannot. This can't be a flop. This has to crush. This is how he's saying it. This has to do really well. Because if he can't make a traditional media like TV show, game show work, then, you know, what like creators will never be able to go to a network and do something like this again. He feels like he's like representative of the creator community right now. That's why creative control was important because he thinks that oftentimes what's happened in the past is that the networks have like taken control of final edit and really changed it from what the creator thought it was going to be. That's a great point. I didn't, I didn't think about that prior that he is really paving this new, this is like a new frontier for if, creators. Yeah. If he can't make it work, then like, you know, then it, that's the, that's the line for the rest and of the, the door is closed. Yeah. For right. Everybody the door else. Is closed. If Jimmy can't do it, you think you, then you can't do it either. Right. For Amazon, this is a very interesting play because this is a, like Mr. Beast has a very captive, huge audience that they're now bringing to their platform. Like this is a, extremely unique opportunity for them to bring in a new likely different like i'm assuming this isn't their target audience right now mm -hmm. consumer um and i'm sure that we'll see more content kind of related that they try to build off 
around this if it's a success to continue to captivate that younger yeah. audience uh yeah i mean i think i think he'll crush it i think he'll do really well i think there's a great amazon tie-in for feastables i think they're probably he he said you know there's no way i'm gonna do like whatever however many hours of content this is and not talk about feastables at all like this <laughs> so uh yeah you, you know where it's going it's gonna be good i think that the challenges the idea he comes up with for challenges for a game show will be like next level right so Squid right. Game is on netflix i think the like real game show yep. movie. and i think this will be like that on like super steroids so totally my last question related to this is let's say it's it's a success what creator might be one of the first creators to follow in his footsteps or to be able to do something like this next with a big i do think there's already a path for crossover for creators like Quinta Brunson, who are uh, entertainment creators, skit creators, to then cross over into like actual comedy, music creators to cross over. Charlie Puth started on YouTube, so did Justin Bieber. Um, you know, so there's already some pathways there. Sports creators uh, this year, ESPN picked up Pat McAfee. Now mm -hmm. Pat was he was an NFL player for a lot of years. Mr. Beast is anything but a YouTuber, and the type of video he makes it's like oh that's like youtubers youtubers do that right so i think that that's what he's carving the pathway for is you know like true you know for uh, a, a finance youtuber to like you know come over and do a like uh undercover boss type of show or something like that you right know, different, different right. version of that but that's what i'm thinking I think of I'm out here thinking of the true youtubers one that i could see is Maybe Marquise Brownlee, Marquez Brownlee having a his own Netflix series around tech or something like that. I, you know, and this is fresh on the mind because I was just uh, on an, a webinar earlier today. We were busting some ecom myths, but like Marquez Brownlee could ho could host a MythBusters type show, <laughs> right? Uh, kind of semi scientific, uh, but entertaining. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so next, there was some news that we saw on Twitter this week around Unilever spinning off Ben & Jerry's, which caught my eye because Ben & Jerry's is no small brand. It's not a dying brand or anything. It's probably in terms of ice cream, one of the most unique brands. And one of they think outside the box, they do a lot differently. The ice cream is crazy. They even had a collab with um, Nike doing a shoe last year. Mm -hmm. And this division made up 13% of total sales as well, which is a huge number. Why do you, why do you think they would do something like this? Uh, a lot of the DNA of Ben and Jerry's is in their founding story. Their founding story is like very profit driven, very bootstrapped. Um, like I think I've heard stories about like how the dude, like the guy like spread these flyers about uh, like dryers and some of those were telling them like, oh, if you pick up this, like we're not going to be in your store anymore. So that's what retailers were telling him. And so then he like started moving these fly, like like spreading these like fr flyers and stuff like that about how that was happening. And that was like his initial like marketing controversy. So I think a lot of where Benning Jerry's is, is like kind of like they've grown because of that. And I don't know if that fits in a, in a large like company like Unilever. I don't know if that, a lot of that innovation still exists. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that's kind of one thing to note. Uh, personally, I, I don't know. I don't think that this is, they're spinning it off into a different company. Basically, I think that company is going to be like all, the better for it. And I think Unilever might actually end up being the worse for it. What do you think? I think... I think that's a great point. I think part of this as well is you know Unilever is trying to focus, shift their focus to more wellness brands. I know you had a content similar related to this around industries yeah. last week, but it's almost like it's a, it's a great thing that they had, but they have to get rid of it to focus on the future of what they believe in. And so cutting back a brand that clearly is is not good for you it's unhealthy or whatever allows them to then focus on that direction of more health and wellness focused products in the future the problem i have with that is that you're not allowed to have a vision like that if you're publicly traded your responsibility is to the shareholders uh that's the point so mm -hmm. you could say that they're betting on the human health optimization and health trend that's going on that was the content i posted was uh that like spend people's consumer spending this is the data I found from our triple well data. People's consumer spending in, you know, health and beauty, sporting goods, 
and especially better for you food and beverage is up massively year over year. Uh, whereas things like clothing and electronics are down. So maybe Unilever is trying to ride that trend. But I also think that that trend's largely driven by some of these companies that like their their true sort of bootstrapped e-com startups like Rise Supplements, mm -hmm. where they're able to like this is all they're doing. They're not some under company under the under the Unilever umbrella. Um, I don't know. I think it's easy to criticize something. Uh, it's a move. It's a bold move. Totally. All right, sweet. So next, there's an article that came out this week, and it's the world's most innovative companies of 2024. Fast Company's annual rankings of the world's most innovative companies okay. covers 58 industries and sectors from advertising to video. So a diverse selection going on here. Okay. And anytime I see something like this, I'm like... This is what, what are they thinking of? Like, what, what are they defining as innovative? This is well informed content, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask you several questions around this. Before we start, can I ask, did they yes. clarify their criteria for most innovative? It says how we pick the world's most innovative companies, and let's see what they say methodology, innovation, impact, timeliness, and relevance. So, a bunch of words that need to be defined even further. Exactly. Basically, exactly. whatever the hell we want is uh, is how we picked it. Criteria one, who paid us the most? That was the number one. It's innovation. Criteria two, who paid us the second most? That was the number two. Uh, uh, all right. All right. So all right. Uh, let's assuming that, that this list is semi, semi, at least semi non paid for, what do we got here? All right. So first, I'm going to I'm gonna tell you what the first one was overall, and we're going to see how he reacts to it. So the first one is NVIDIA. Yeah, of course. For bringing chips to the AI party. Does that make sense to you? They were already doing that. NVIDIA just continued to do what they were already doing. It just hap just so happened that the the chips that like AI uses, I don't understand this super well, but the chips that AI uses are very different. They're GPUs. They're very different mm -hmm. than the chips that like computers use, which are CPUs. They were already doing those for gaming. Right. It's not like they brought a new product. They were just like, oh, hey, you guys all want to do this? Our chips do that. Uh, so did they innovate? I don't know. They, uh, certainly did something long enough to grab a market opportunity. And, yep, I, and the timeliness. Honestly, I think they did it well. They were doing gaming or they already had that market corner. That's great. Right. And they, they were ahead of the curve. Then yeah. the timeliness made sense. It's helping propel the industry forward. I think that makes sense. Yeah. A crazy one that's on this list is Novo Nordisk, which are the makers behind Ozempic. Which okay. Has been all the rave. Where do you think that shows up? on this top 50. An innovation. Okay, so if Ozempic is the miracle thing people say it is, then that's pretty innovative, right? Like if you sure. could just lose weight with no effort, if we stop having weight-related illnesses with no effort, then that's pretty, like magic pills are, if it's an actual magic pill, that is certainly innovative. Right. The only other thing that's a magic weight loss pill is like, like meth or like cocaine, right? So- <laughs> Yeah, that are clearly bad for you. Yeah, there's the the trade off is not worth it. So uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't know about I don't know if we're ready to call Ozempic like if we're ready to call this one and say like yeah, it's great, innovative. Uh, we might be we might be trying to backpedal that uh, in a couple of years, but who knows? Well, uh, according no to change if you're on Ozempic, Ethan. I know that I know you are ripped like that. So I don't like needles very much, so we're, we're not doing that. <laughs> but. I just want to say that Fast Company does say it is very innovative. It is number two on the list. Overall. Number two seems, I mean, it, it's either there or it isn't. And if it is, then probably top 10, top five mm -hmm. probably seems right. All right. So next, I just wanted to point out that a company that is not on the list Ooh. is SpaceX. <laughs> but a company that is on the list is Sphere Entertainment, the makers of the Las Vegas Sphere. The sphere just seems very Las Vegas to me, right? Like everything is that big and bright and lighty there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they didn't do it, somebody was going to. I think it's I think it's innovative, um, but I think it's it's interesting. It's also you know being talked about a ton. It's it's innovative in a certain niche. You anchored that by saying that SpaceX was not on the list, which is wild it should be top five for sure that's what i think like it's yeah. putting the biggest rockets ever into space it's yeah i mean it's innovating like there's no other way that you could describe what spacex does it's like right. literally going into a to space and trying to make it so that humans 
can live not just on earth. Like it's crazy. And the reason I said that, the reason why it came up was there's a company at number 10 here called connect X and it says for charting the path to distant asteroids and back again, I haven't heard of this company before, but something space related. And so when I heard that, I was like, hold on. Like I saw the sphere on the list. I was like, let me see if SpaceX is on the list, but then it, it wasn't. So again, kind of, that seems like a, that seems like a very notable and purposeful snub to me. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it makes me put a little less stock in the list. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe this is the play. Maybe Elon goes up into space, creates a sphere twice the size of the Las Vegas sphere that orbits the Earth. <laughs> then he's like, do I get on there now? I love it. All right, so two more questions related to this list. Where do you think OpenAI, if they're on the list, where do you think they fall on the list? If NVIDIA wasn't top 10 or top number one, and I, we, you also said what number two was already, uh, Ozempic. So yep. if it wasn't like, that's where I would have open AI is like, you would think that for 2023, like it's it's the clear winner other than that little Sam Altman fumble. But as a company, it, it's definitely the clear winner. So I guess maybe number three. So number three is not open AI, but it's the company that has helped funding them, make them successful Microsoft okay. and then open AI falls not too far down after that at number nine. Nine seems low. It seems like it should be yep. top five for sure. I hear you. And then the last point is there's one company though that falls in between those two companies, which is not like the rest of these companies. They make food. They make food. Uh, that I'll give you one more hint. They're a fast food chain. What do you think this company is? Fast food chain. Okay, come ones that come to mind would be like uh, Panda Express, Chipotle, Jimmy John's, and Taco Bell. It is Taco Bell, which is crazy. Um, yeah. No, I yeah, I like that. I like it. Taco like Bell's it. ahead of OpenAI on the most innovative <laughs> companies list. And it's crazy. And we know, you know, there's no clear way to Who measure innovation. This? It's it's up for whatever. But I I read into this and they, they talked about like how they're making tacos more than just a food. There's a movement behind it. Um, they had a very successful Taco Tuesday campaign this year where they actually got rid of their trademark over Taco Tuesday. Their approach is very culturally savvy. Mm-hmm. They have a recent CEO. I don't know how long he's been the CEO, but he's credited with driving these innovation efforts forward. He, he used to work at Nike. And then the last line here is that Taco Bell's focus extends beyond being a quick service restaurant and for being a globally recognized brand. Which- Look, I, dude, I love what Taco Bell does. I love their marketing. They're like the liquid death of fast food. That's how we're going to say <laughs> anytime something's just like all steak, all sizzle, no steak, it's just all marketing and the product's just whatever. That's They're the liquid death of that thing, which is, I mean, honestly, a compliment to liquid yeah, death. Yeah, yeah, totally. Maybe liquid death I mean- is Taco Bell of water. But, you know, Taco Bell is the liquid death of, of fast food. Fair enough. You heard it here. All right. So to close it out, I think you have uh, some of your favorite tweets from this tweets week. Tweets of the week. Through. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> tweets of the week. A little tweets of the week. We got a jingle. Tweets of the week. Hell yeah. Okay. So first up, so this is from Michelle Goad, who is founder of GoFall Digital, social first commerce agency. She used to be at Nike. So uh, she's at Shop Talk and the C- this is this is what she said. I'm at Shop Talk and the CMO of American Eagle just said, uh, she's paraphrasing that as Gen Z's number one retailer, advertising in linear TV and print are far in the rear view mirror. As the former leader of Gen Z innovation at Nike, which is kind of crazy that that's even a title that they have. Uh, <laughs> my recommendation to divest of these channels in 2019 and invest in social, gaming, streaming, et cetera, ruffled a lot of feathers internally. But you have to be where the consumer is, and the next generation consumer hasn't been on linear TV outside of sports in a long time. I'm excited to see how the incumbent streaming initiatives can be bundled together to create new touch points for the brands to show up. Uh, Prime Video and Netflix are leading the pack as expected. Where are the others? What do you make of this? Part of me is like, it's a hot take. Maybe it was a hotter take in 2019. And then part of me is like, well, well, duh. And I, and, yeah. like, and I, and I guess maybe this is that I'm like part of the Gen Z push, but like, we haven't watched cable since before 2019. 
like, yeah, this makes sense. The fact that the CMO of American Eagle is saying that now on a talk, it's like, yeah, yeah obviously. So um, I had no idea this was a hot take, honestly. Uh, as spe- so the irony that I find here, first of all, shop talk is a very safe. If this is something that ruffles feathers in large corporations like American Eagle or Nike, shop talk is a very safe place to say something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's it's full of like D 2 C people and stuff, uh, but the the fact that Nike had a person whose title was leader of Gen Z innovation that was their title. All right, so imagine your big company, you know, your CEO at Nike. So you gotta make like imagine you're old, you're an old guy. I don't know who the CEO at Nike is, but like imagine you're an old dude who's gonna get his feathers ruffled by stuff. That person who is supposed to be your Gen Z expert, you're th- they're there, you're, they're your go to on Gen Z. They come to you and they're like, hey, guess what? Gen Z doesn't watch TV. And you're like, I don't, mm, nah, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> like, that makes no sense to me. Number one, even if you hadn't, even if you're completely unplugged, like, just trust them. Number one, you should just know that you realize you're completely unplugged. Number two, what obvious, like, this just seems like the most obvious thing ever. I can't believe this was a hot take even in 2019. I can't believe that this ruffled feathers in 2019. I, I guess it just maybe is, I, I don't have the insight into how entrenched certain ideas are in, in uh, like legacy companies like Nike. I hear you. And as we talk through it, one of the things that does stand out is that when you think of iconic Nike ads, a lot of those ads are in the form for TV in the spotlight. So it was probably like a huge yeah. staple of their strategy that was very hard to hear. And then they do say um, in this tweet that, the, the next generation of consumer hasn't been on linear TV outside of sports in a long time, but naturally a lot of Nike's marketing is related to sports. That's fair. Um, having said that though, the way that consumers watch sports is, is evolving. And it's like, I might still be watching things that are on ESPN, but I'm watching it through the app now. And yeah. in a lot of, I think what this point gets at is that, more of the consumers are shifting to watch the same things through connected instead of linear TV. And there's just so much more of an ability to segment and target and and see that data on connected TV. Um, But that's me just slightly, probably slightly defending Nike because they have a, you know, they're they're probably in the hardest part of accepting this change given their sports. Yep. All right. Next up. I'm going to show you an ad that somebody posted. Uh, shout out to Alexa Kilroy, former Triple Whale team member, uh, for posting this ad she found this week. Uh, her, I think her caption was like, this is a very aggressive us versus them ad. So <laughs> this is from Remy, which is like a t- uh, they send your like retainers or they send corrective teeth stuff to you so you can make your teeth not crooked, right? So direct to consumer orthodontics, I guess. I don't even know what you call that category. Uh, Mm -hmm. But they have an us versus them against Smile Direct Club. Us side says perfect smile after club, after direct, perfect smile after Smile Direct Club treatment. The Smile Direct Club side says took your money. (laughs) The Remy side says puts their customer first. The Smile Direct Club side says unprofessional. Remy side says loves you till the end. Smile Direct Club side says left you mid treatment. Mm-hmm. Remy side says saving you money and keeps your smile straight. Remy sides or smile direct club side says gone bankrupt. <laughs> what What's your take on this? I love it. Um, it's aggressive. I, I, I didn't know what Remy was before this, but you get it in this picture. It's like, they're an alternative to smile direct club. They're probably a lot smaller. They're willing to get more personal and yeah. they care about their customers more. They're basically taking the big guy. They're like that's the man. It's Remy versus the man. Usually in us like, versus them ads, it's like us versus the other guys. This has been going on in TV forever. Like uh, it's like, you know, yeah. Bounty, other leading brand. And then it shows how Bounty picks up all the liquid, right? Uh, but like to just be like, no, nah, no, nah, not other leading brand. We all know who we're talking about here. Like yeah, yeah, throw it yeah. out there. It's uh, crazy. And, and they a have a bank they... stamp over the Smile Direct Club <laughs> logo. I have That's one crazy. I have one call out here, then we can move on. The yeah. you can you can't really see because this is a screenshot, so you can't really see. Like I can't double click on this, but you can see that the copy is seven reasons to make the switch from Smile Direct Club to Remy Retainers. Mm-hmm. What are the seven reasons? Isn't there just one reason you can't get Smile Direct Club anymore? 
<laughs> Small Direct Club is that's, yeah, it's bank, it's bankrupt. So I don't I, wanna, I don't understand. Now I want to find the post and expand it and read the seven reasons below. <laughs> yeah, too. seven reason. Reason one: uh, you can't even have Small Direct Club. Reason two: <laughs> that's it. Click the link. All right, next one from Social Savannah. Pretty good follow on Twitter if you're looking for a good follow. She says, your ad length should be the age of your customer. Targeting 25 to 34-year-olds, that's the perfect ad length for this demographic. Under 18, you better have a super short and snappy TikToks. Uh, 65 plus, they convert best on videos longer than a minute. They have hmm. longer attention spans. Pretty dang accurate. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty dang accurate. <laughs> like, this is a good rule of thumb. You know, if you're wondering, hey, how long should my videos be for my ads? Like my uh, customers are like 25 to 40 year old moms. Like, oh, they should probably be like 25 to 40 seconds. Or at least you should be, get, be able to get the main point across in 25 to 40 seconds. Yeah, and I think it's uh, two things I thought of related to this is one, like if you need to figure out someone's age and you don't know how to ask them, like, show them this tweet and be like, how long would your ad be? So you could yeah. say something like when that. When you see right? ads on social media, how long do you watch them for? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, um, I know there's been all the stuff going around around like, oh, you might be 45, but like my biological age is 30. And it's like I'm trying to live longer and doing stuff like that. But like, what is your uh, consumer age? Yeah, what's your consumer age? So you could yeah, that's survey, like, what's your optimal ad length? Oh, it's a minute or more. Like 25, <laughs> your consumer age is 60 plus. My, is this correlated with biological age or <laughs> actual age? That's my question. Like if you're a 60 year old with a 50 biological age, like do you just want, like is your attention span not as good? Maybe that's the trade-off of having a better biological age is that you just don't have the attention span. Science, sure. science. Science, science. All right. Last one, uh, kind of an interesting one. Macy's is running UGC style ads. So uh, here's like a traditional, like some, you know, Macy's ads, just to kind of describe what I'm seeing here. We got like Macy's ads, mm -hmm. like Macy's products, typically stuff you'd see in a nice, well-lit uh, studio shoot on Instagram. And uh, basically it's like, they went like halfway with it, right? Cause we got somebody shooting it at home, but clearly they told them needs to have a white background, like yeah. shit into a white curtain or a white bed or something like that. So it still looks a little, it doesn't look like UGC. They kind of went down the middle. What do you think? Yeah. A lot of times things like this will surface up once in a while. And I'm always curious, like, is every big brand trying this and we're only seeing it sometimes or like, or only some brands creative, creative enough to try it? Because I do think if done right, it looks like an organic post. Yeah. But I'm so curious, like, which brands does content like this work for and how many are trying it? Because I think a lot of people just aren't even trying it. Yeah. The principle of this, like, hey, let's try and, you know, have some content that's a little bit more UGC style, raw, native to platform, whatever you want to call it. UGC is user generated content, if you don't know what that means. So that's just like somebody taking a picture with their iPhone versus having, you know, taking a picture in a studio. Um, this is clearly a miss. I think this is worse than either, right? Like you could go all the way raw or all the way studio and that even all the way studio would be better than this. I like that they're trying stuff, but you know, I have a hard time believing that there's nobody at Macy's who saw this and was like, this isn't guys, this isn't what we mean. Like this isn't <laughs> right. Uh, but I think they're probably just so bogged down in like regulations and brand guidelines that maybe this is like the best they came up with. And that's, Back to your point, Ethan, that's probably where I think it's the biggest mist is if you're applying all the brand guidelines to your like raw UGC style content or even your organic social approach, you're probably missing. Right. And the other thing that's so weird to me here is that there's like no contrast or pop in either of these pictures. <laughs> it's like they shot it on a white background so the shoe would stand out, but then that's it. You could see the shadow on the second picture, like yeah. over the shoe. So that that's another thing too. Like even when I know maybe you're trying to make it in an intentionally lower quality picture, but like any decent UGC creator me knows like just go over by the window, you know, like shoot it by the window. So there's good lighting. So yeah, mm -hmm. they kind of made it like, raw and low quality in the wrong way. But I appreciate yeah. the attempt. I, I think it's a miss for them. They should probably the last thing. If they can't do anything better than this. They should just go back to shooting brand and stuff. Go ahead. I am curious though. So the last thing I'll say is Macy's if, if you are watching this and we are wrong and this ad is crushing it, let us know. 
So we're, we're curious. Oh, crushing like, it. They have a big, they have a big brand. So I bet it there, I bet it's doing okay, but how is it doing relative to their other stuff? That's right. 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 Well, I think that's it. Uh, we gotta, we need like a good ending thing. So this is what I just came up with. All right, Ethan, that's everything. It's time to come up for air. Cause whale, uh, whales come up, they breathe air. Yeah. Cause we've been, we've been in the ocean yeah. getting well. Blow holes are, in. yeah. We've been in the ocean, right? Like, and so now we're, yep. or now our blow holes are clear. I don't know if that one's as good. That one feels weird. Yeah. And then right now we need to cue the video of a huge whale jumping out of the water yeah. and splashing. <laughs> Patricio, editor, big whale. That's it. That's all. Bye. Bye.